The Conditions of Culture by T.S. Eliot A new civilization is always being made. The state of affairs that we enjoy today illustrates what happens to the aspirations of each age for a better one. The most important question that we can ask is whether there is any permanent standard by which we can compare one civilization with another, and by which we can make some guess at the improvement or decline of our own. We have to admit, in comparing one civilization with another, and in comparing the different stages of our own, that no society and no one age of it realizes all of the values of civilization. Not all of these values may be compatible with each other. What is at least as certain is that in realizing some, we lose the appreciation of others. Nevertheless, we can distinguish between advance and retrogression. We can assert with some confidence that our own period is one of decline, that the standards of culture are lower than they were 50 years ago, and that the evidences of this decline are visible in every department of human activity. I see no reason why the decay of culture should not proceed much further, and why we may not even anticipate a period of some duration of which it is possible to say that it will have no culture. Then culture will have to grow again from the soil. And when I say it must grow again from the soil, I do not mean that it will be brought into existence by any activity of political demagogues. The question is whether there are any permanent conditions in the absence of which no higher culture can be expected. If we succeed even partially in answering this question, we must then put ourselves on guard against the delusion of trying to bring about these conditions for the sake of the improvement of our culture. For if any definite conclusions emerge from this study, one of them is surely this, that culture is the one thing we cannot deliberately aim at. It is the product of a variety of more or less harmonious activities, each pursued for its own sake. The artist must concentrate upon his canvas, the poet upon his typewriter, the civil servant upon the just settlement of particular problems as they present themselves upon his desk, each according to the situation in which he finds himself. Even if these conditions, with which I am concerned, seem to the reader to represent desirable social aims, he must not leap to the conclusion that these aims can be fulfilled solely by deliberate organization. A class division of society planned by an absolute authority would be artificial and intolerable. A decentralization under central direction would be a contradiction. An ecclesiastical unity cannot be imposed in the hope that it will bring about unity of faith. In a religious diversity cultivated for its own sake, would be absurd. The point at which we can arrive is the recognition that these conditions of culture are natural to human beings, that although we can do little to encourage them, we can combat the intellectual errors and the emotional prejudices which stand in their way. For the rest, we should look for the improvement of society as we seek our own individual improvement in relatively minute particulars. We cannot say, I shall make myself into a different person. We can only say, I will give up this bad habit and endeavor to contract this good one. So of society, we can only say, we shall try to improve it in this respect or the other, where excess or defect is evident. We must try at the same time to embrace so much in our view that we may avoid, in putting one thing right, putting something else wrong. Even this is to express an aspiration greater than we can achieve, for it is as much or more because of what we do piecemeal, without understanding or foreseeing the consequences, that the culture of one age differs from that of its predecessor. The causes of a total decline of culture are as complex as the evidence of it is various. Some may be found in the accounts given by various specialists, 
of the causes of more readily apprehended social ailments for which we must continue to seek specific remedies. Yet we become more and more aware of the extent to which the baffling problem of culture underlies the problems of the relation of every part of the world to every other. When we concern ourselves with the relation of the great nations to each other, the relation of the great to the small nations, the relation of intermixed communities, as in India, to each other, the relation of parent nations to those which have originated as colonies, the relation of the colonists to the native, the relation between peoples of such areas as the West Indies, where compulsion or economic inducement has brought together large numbers of different races. Behind all these perplexing questions involving decisions to be made by many men every day, there is the question of what culture is, and the question whether it is anything that we can control or deliberately influence. These questions confront us whenever we devise a theory or frame a policy of education. If we take culture seriously, we see that a people does not need merely enough to eat, though even that is more than we seem to be able to ensure, but a proper and particular cuisine. One symptom of the decline of culture in Britain is indifference to the art of preparing food. Culture may even be described simply as that which makes life worth living. And it is what justifies other peoples and other generations in saying, when they contemplate the remains and the influence of an extinct civilization, that it was worthwhile for that civilization to have existed. From Notes Towards a Definition of Culture, 1948.